Recording. Uh, on, behalf, on behalf of the International Buddhist Confederation, IBC, I would like to welcome you all to the Dhamma Talk 6, which is a part of the ongoing uh, fortnightly program, International Dhamma Talk series that commenced on 29th of November, 2021. So for today, we, have, we are very happy and honored to have with us our teacher, Venerable Ajahn Amro, Abbot Amravati Buddhist Monastery, England, who would be teaching us on the topic, uh, constructive and destructive emotions. Thank you, Venerable, for being here with us. So with this, I'd like to share Venerable's brief bio. Venerable Ajahn Amar Amro was born in 1956 in England. He went to London University and received an honors degree in psychology and physiology in 1977. He was ordained as a bhikkhu by Venerable Ajahn Chah in 1979. He trained in England from 1979 to 95 under Venerable Ajahn Sumedho's guidance. After first visiting the US in 1990, he founded a Bayagiri Monastery in 1996 in Redwood Valley, California. He was co abbot there with Venerable Ajahn Pasanno until 2010, when Ajahn Sumedho's, uh, when on Ajahn Sumedho's invitation, he took up the role of abbot at Amravati Buddhist Monastery, England. He has authored or co-authored about 30 books. He's a cousin of the Buddhist scholar and former president of the Pali Tech Society, late I.B. Horner. Um, now, uh, now may I request uh, Venerable Dr. Dhamma Piaji, Secretary General IBC, to kindly welcome our teacher, Venerable Dhamma Piaji. Namo Tessa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambudasa Namo Tessa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambudasa Namo Tessa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambudasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Dudhyampi Tatiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami A very good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all venerable masters, venerable monks, venerable nuns, brothers and sisters in Dhamma who have joined this Dhamma talk today from different countries and different time zone. On behalf of IBC, International Buddhist Confederation, I take this honor and opportunity to welcome you all, especially at our most venerable Ajahn Amaru, today's speaker. Most venerable Ajahn Amaru will speak on emotion. Emotion plays very important role in life. And whatever we act, it is being affected by our thoughts. And the thoughts are also being influenced by our emotions. And emotions are also in turn being influenced by our worldview or perspective. So these are interconnected. And this 
worldview, our thoughts and emotion can either be something positive or something negative. I think in the words of our venerable Ajahn Amaro, it's like either destructive or constructive. So it is a good opportunity to look into this emotion from Buddhist point of view, probably it may not be wrong to say uh, from the psychological point of view and this Buddhist psychology point of view. So I heartily welcome most venerable Ajahn Amaro. Uh, please take the floor now. Please venerable. Thank you very much. I will um, begin the Dhamma talk in our customary uh, traditional way. Namo tassa bhakavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhakavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhakavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Puthang dhamang sankhang namasami Well, I'm very uh, honoured and happy to uh, offer some reflections uh, for the International Buddhist Confederation. Uh, this is my first uh, contact with this group and I'm happy to uh, make this connection. Uh, so uh, I'll speak for, uh, for some time and then there'll be a period for questions and answers at the end, I believe. I'm not sure quite how that will be organised, but uh, I trust that the uh, International Buddhist Confederation have got that figured out. So uh, they, uh, I asked for a variety of topics to choose from when uh, I was invited to give this, this talk. And uh, one of them on the list was this title of uh, constructive and destructive emotions. And I thought that was a very fertile area to explore. There's a lot that is there in uh, Buddhist, a lot of Buddhist teachings uh, and uh, a lot that is very, very relevant uh, in monastic training, also in, in lay life and everyday, uh, say, exercising of the Buddha's teachings and the practices in our daily lives, whether we're a lay person or a monastic, and irrespective of which Buddhist tradition that we are uh, aligned with. I also notice that this group has got a, a, a large variety of different um, sort of Dhamma affiliations from the uh, Southern Buddhist uh, tradition of, from Myanmar, from Thailand, from Sri Lanka, from India, also uh, from uh, Tibet and um, Vietnam uh, and uh, other Buddhist uh, communities. So I'm very uh, happy to be able to offer these reflections on this area, which I think is uh, very important, significant in, uh, in uh, every Buddhist tradition. So when we take terms like constructive uh, emotions or destructive emotions, then if we look at the, the classical teachings, then we have, a, a, say, a list of, say, metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, loving kindness, uh, 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 the quality of compassion, uh, the quality of sympathetic joy, joy of the good fortune of others, and equanimity or serenity. Upeka. So these are, are sort of a, a, a very simple classical array of, of wholesome emotions, that what they call, say, uh, skillful emotions, uh, the Brahma Viharas, the, the sublime abidings. And then on the, on the negative side, the destructive emotions, we have things like uh, uh, loba, dosa, moha, greed, uh, hatred, delusion, also bhaya, uh, fear, and uh, pride, jealousy, um, these are, are taken to be uh, sort of destructive or obstructive emotions. And so we can, we can look at the, the texts or read the suttas and, and get a very superficial view. Well, these are the good emotions to have, and these are the bad ones. The, the good ones we should get more of, and the bad ones we should get rid of. But uh, I felt it would be useful today to talk about how um, such um, 
say, naming of, uh, uh, of emotions as constructive and destructive, it, it, uh, it can be um, sort of taking things for, for granted. It, it can be looking at things in a very superficial way. And that uh, what we think of as constructive emotions, wholesome emotions like loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, uh, serenity, um, these can have negative uh, aspects to them. And uh, uh, so to, to reflect on that and to be uh, aware of when are these emotions, when are these uh, qualities of the heart, when are, when are they beneficial and, and liberative, and when are they uh, obstructive and, and productive of, of more suffering, of dukkha. So with, uh, um, I'll try not to make a laundry list <laughs> as I go through this, but to talk about these different areas. Uh, also, uh, later on, I thought also to reflect on the positive aspects of, of uh, what we call destructive emotions, because uh, there can be, as I said, we can have a, a very simplistic, superficial view and, uh, and not be seeing the, the deeper teaching, which is there in the, in the Buddha's teachings in, the, in these uh, many and various suttas. He talks about uh, wrong understanding of particular qualities and and so uh, this, these are the areas I'd like to talk about today. So with loving kindness, uh, in, in English, the word, uh, the word love uh, tends to imply the quality of, of liking. To say, you know, I, I, I love this, uh, the, the spring weather, or I, I love uh, uh, this, this place, or I love my, my house, which means to say, I, I like it. I like the weather. I like the house. I like uh, this person. But one of the, the things that uh, uh, Venerable Ajahn Sumedho often pointed out and he, and when he first came to teach in the United Kingdom in uh, the late 70s, he found that um, when he talked about metta and the cult cultivation of metta just as loving kindness, uh, then people tended to hear it in a way that they assumed that, that with metta, you're trying to like everything. And that that seemed very false or, or, or um, uh, undoable. You know, that, that was something that was impossible to do. That, uh, and uh, he saw that, that there was a, a reaction that would come from people when you're talking about loving kindness and, and the classical form, may I be happy, may all beings be happy. Um, and going through... Uh, I think someone needs to turn their microphone off. <laughs> so, uh, so the loving kindness, uh, he, he uh, very quickly realized it was, it was not that helpful to talk of in, just in terms of love because of the way, particularly in English, the word is used. And he instead started to talk about metta as not dwelling in aversion, which really means a, a radical acceptance of, the, of an experience or a, a, a situation uh, another person or, or a, even a, of a mind state, not pretending that you like it, not even trying to make yourself like things that are unlikable, but recognizing this has a place in nature. So a, a terminology like not dwelling in aversion might not really make the heart sing. <laughs> it might not seem very kind of uh, inspiring or, or, or bright or, or, or colorful, um, but rather the... Uh, um, the, the most uh, accurate and helpful way of understanding metta is that it's an open-heartedness uh, and that rather than trying to make yourself like everything, because some things are not likable, so that if you have a, a, you have a migraine headache or you have a, uh, a conflict in your family and, and, uh, and uh, a repetitive arguments and difficulties with family members, uh, that's not likable but you can open the heart to recognize this is the way things are. There can be that kind of radical acceptance. So that uh, if we are taking a, a constructive emotion like metta, and if we hold it in a way that we're trying to make ourselves like the unlikable, then uh, it, it can create a lot of confusion, a lot of, lot of negativity, and also aversion to the practice of, of metta. Uh, I've, uh, Many years ago, when leading meditation retreats, I would often have a uh, have a day of the ten day retreat that would be focusing on metta practice. 
and using the sort of classical forms of the uh, of reflection, like may I be may I be happy, may all beings be happy, uh, and uh, so on and so forth, but going through various categories of beings, and and sometimes it would be the case that people would, the retreatants would say, well, I was doing fine on the retreat until we got to the meta day, then I got really angry. <laughs> It was really irritating. It was so sugary, so so sweet, so kind of uh, uh, superficial that um, it was it was like you're trying to make us think pink, Ajahn, and uh, bringing up a, a kind of negativity. So that's uh, one aspect of loving kindness. I feel that uh, to to make uh, what is sort of presented as a constructive emotion genuinely constructive to. Uh, establish uh, rather than trying to like everything to see that that uh, that quality of metta is recognizing that everything belongs everything is a part of, of nature and that uh, that radical acceptance uh, is a uh, is a the basis of loving kindness but then it also has a, an expressive part as well so the loving kind the um Radical acceptance is like breathing in, it's like the in-breath, it's the receptive part of loving kindness and the expression of, of warmth or friendliness, benevolence, uh, and uh, that sense of well-wishing, uh, uh, then that comes from, uh, uh, that's an expressive aspect like the out-breath, and that uh, is based very much on that sense of everything belongs. And so that you, in that way, you can genuinely have feelings of benevolence or well-wishing to things that you don't like, but you can uh, you can have a quality you can cultivate that quality of uh, of well-wishing even to people that you don't like, even people who want to give you problems, even uh, things that are, are difficult like illnesses that you you might have or uh, crises in, in the family. You might not you might not like them, but you can have a quality of open-heartedness to that and say, well, here it is. So that you can, you can uh, say, have that quality of metta to things that uh, you do not like. Similarly, another uh, aspect of, of metta that is, uh, is uh, confusing or, or difficult, people say, oh, uh, they, again, coming from the use of the word love, perhaps, but uh, attachment to our uh, the the possessions that we have the people who are close to us our family members that uh, the, we see that the the buddha teaching encourages us to have uh, abundant metta to have metta for all beings uh, and then that but that metta then turns into a quality of possessive love uh, a, a a sense of ownership you belong to me i belong to you we belong to each other and uh, the buddha pointed out that that kind of loving that uh, which is uh, called pia piati in uh, in Pali. That uh, that kind of dearness uh, has a possessive quality to that, and that will always bring a a, 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 a result of dukkha with it. That that kind of possessive love necessarily brings dukkha along with it. Uh, it's natural enough. It's familiar enough to us uh, in, in the human world in our human family, but uh, it, we can mistake. That kind of possessive love, or that that uh, sense of ownership that that slides into the uh, the relationships we have with others, we can mistake that for genuine loving kindness. And I would say that that uh, genuine metta, uh, loving kindness, like the other Brahma Viharas, the other sublime abidings, they are what I call a, a liberative love. They are they are a uh, they are a love that lets go, that is non attached, and is not possessive, and that leads towards uh, the um, abundant, exalted, immeasurable qualities of the heart. It leads uh, away from dukkha and, and towards liberation. So we're, with respect to uh, compassion, uh, karuna, again, uh, in many of our Buddhist traditions, this is a very central quality and a, a very important attribute. But uh, if, if karuna is not... Uh, and not understood or practiced in a skillful way, then it can become a cause of great anxiety, great difficulty. I lived in California for a long time as uh, 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 the person, uh, Punsok, uh, giving the introduction, um, uh, was describing, uh, uh, I lived in California for a long time, and uh, it's very pronounced living in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. A lot of people put a lot of time and energy 
into noble causes and really worked very, very hard to take care of other beings uh, the, 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 in the, the human social needs, uh, in the animal world, uh, the trees, uh, looking after uh, forests and such like, uh, is a tremendous and very heartfelt uh, effort uh, of compassionate uh, activity uh, that is a focus of, of Buddhist practice and, and people in that, that area. But it was very noticeable to me uh, how many people suffered uh, a lot because of their compassionate activity, their compassionate interest, and that uh, it really came home to me during that time is that that uh, in, in Buddhist practice, karuna is not a state of suffering. <laughs> Again, it's a, maybe it's a little bit of a difficulty with the English language is part of it, but compassion literally means to suffer with in English from compassio in the, the Latin, means to suffer with, whereas karuna is not a state of suffering. And that uh, I would say that uh, in Buddhist practice, if you are suffering on, the, on, the, uh, on account of the suffering of another, that's a distorted compassion. It's, a, it's not a, a true karuna. It's not, it's not a, a well-balanced or well-integrated quality of karuna. And so that uh, it's uh, uh, when we are practicing compassion, carrying out, and many of the people gathered together today, I'm sure, uh, very deeply involved in helping others, helping other people, helping the, the environment, helping uh, the, the world of animals and uh, the, the living uh, biosphere that we're all a part of, uh, and Satu, Satu Anamotana for everyone's good work. But I feel it's important to understand how to practice compassion without it becoming a source of suffering or stress or burdenness. And I also speak a lot from personal experience when I was younger as a, as a teenager uh, and uh, coming into monastic life, I used to take the suffering of other people, other beings very personally. And I felt I should be doing something to help. And, it, and if I, I'm trying to help and they're still suffering, then it's my fault that they're still suffering. So I, I, I shed a lot of tears <laughs> as a child and, uh, that, and felt things very, very strongly. Uh, and so uh, this is an area that I can relate to. So one of the, the, uh, the things that is also related to the practice of metta and also the other um, Brahma Viharas, also uh, uh, sympathetic joy and equanimity, uh, serenity, is if we uh, relate to compassion from a place of self-view, uh, sakaya ditti, then if I make it my job, I've got to make things all right for you. Your suffering is my responsibility. I've got to do something to make, make it possible for you to stop suffering. Yeah, that can seem like a very noble and, and appropriate, beautiful intention. But notice the amount of I and you that's, that's in that. And so the more that compassion can be exercised by um, uh, a heart that is free of self-view, then we do what we can do, and then what we can't do, then we don't create suffering about. And I would never had that thought uh, it crossed my mind until I was uh, a young novice in the monastery in northeast Thailand at Wat, Wat Ba Nana Cha in, in Ubon province in northeast Thailand. And uh, a Thai layman came to visit, and we were talking about helping others and, and compassionate activity. And then he, he made this very interesting comment. He said, well, uh, I do what I can do, but what I can't do, I don't create suffering around, because then you've got two suffering beings rather than one. And I thought, what? <laughs> it can't be that simple. And he said, uh, and so I, I think I said that kind of thing to him. And it was very unusual in that he could speak some English as a, a Thai visitor. It was quite rare in that part of the country. Anyway, I, uh, uh, I said, well, how do you understand that? How do you figure that? He said, well, I realize that I, I trust that I, I do what I, I'm doing what I can. I know I'm not lazy. I know I'm not unkind. I know that I care. But there's also a limit to what I can do. I might be able to lift a 50 pound rock, but I can't lift a 100 pound rock. That's beyond my limit. So uh, within the capacity that I have, I know that if I could do more, I would do more. But this is what I can do. So I do what I can do. And then I don't create suffering about what's out of my scope, what's beyond my capacity. And I, I think I, at the time I just thought, wow, <laughs> that has never occurred to me. Uh, but what a wonderful and helpful principle. And so uh, it, uh, in terms of 
using that kind of recognition of capacity and not looking at, at compassionate activity from just an idealistic perspective, then we can change our view of how we help others, whether it's the animal world or the human world, or whether it's uh, the, the you know, forests or, or whatever it might be. Uh, the, uh, the, the effort can be made free of self-view, uh, just as with samavayamo, the, the factor of the Eightfold Path. There has to be a way that effort can be made, work can be done that is free of self-view, otherwise it would always lead to suffering. There has to be a way that we can make decisions, take action, and work for the benefit of others without that being stressful, without that being something that creates anxiety and uh, self-criticism within us. But again, when I was living in the, in the USA, there was a, a, a layman who was part of our uh, Abhayagiri Monastery community, one of the lay ministers, uh, and he was a, a therapist, a physical therapist. And he had three principles that he taught his students that I felt were, uh, uh, were extremely wise. And so I often pass them on in this respect in terms of uh, skillful, compassionate activity. So as he was a physical therapist, uh, then there was a lot of uh, like body work or, or um, uh, like uh, the, um, the kind of physiotherapy or, or um, massage uh, uh, involved in, the, in his work. So he uh, one of the, the principles he outlined was don't push, just use the weight of your own body. The second one is don't diagnose, just be aware. And the third one was don't try to help, but don't turn away. And uh, I felt these are you know, extremely helpful principles because what uh, uh, where self-view gets involved in compassion is like, I should, I must, I've got to, and it becomes, I've got to help you. And uh, that, that kind of busyness or, or stressfulness in me, I've got, to, I've got to do something to fix you, then that, uh, uh, in a sense, masks a natural attunement that we have to a situation. So what he represents in this is don't push, just use the weight of your own body. It doesn't mean break contact from the work that you're doing. It means don't push. <laughs> just lean into situations, look and see and, and feel things out. Don't diagnose, just be aware. I'm a, a somewhat of a compulsive explainer. I like to have, uh, uh, ever since I was about two or three years old, I was ready to spell out life in the universe and everything to, to anybody. Even if I didn't understand it, I was ready to be an authority. So <laughs> that sense of, well, not being too quick to jump in and explain and, and to say, I've got it all figured out, but be aware, attune to the situation, pay attention. And then uh, the, the last one, don't try to help, but don't turn away. Again, that tryingness that I've got to do something can bring a sort of stressful, fretful, uh, anxious attitude. And, uh, and rather than, uh, than say, uh, being uh, guided by that or motivated by that, instead, if we, uh, if we stop trying to help and just pay attention, then the ways that help can most effectively be given that that uh, appears or becomes becomes obvious. So one of the uh, the, the principles or, or images that is very helpful in this respect, I feel, is that from the Northern Buddhist tradition, the Bodhisattva of uh, Guan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, or Chen Rezik in uh, Tibet. And the, the, the name Av Avalokiteshvara, uh, all these names, Guan Xi Yin, Pusa, and uh, they mean the one who listens to the sounds of the world, or the cries of the world. And so that uh, whether it's from Tibet or from China or from Japan or Korea or, or uh, Mongolia, you know, wherever you see these images of, of Guan Yin, whether uh, uh, depending on the different um, tradition, the iconography changes a bit, but the, the name is the same. And the name means the one who listens to the sounds of the world. And so then that the basis of compassion is that quality of listening rather than doing. So some of the images of, of, of Guan Yin, of, uh, of Alokiteshvara, have a, 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 you know, the, the one body in the center and then a, a thousand arms and a, with a, a thousand hands and a thousand eyes. And so that uh, represents the, uh, the range of activity and skillful, skillful means that the compassionate heart can engage with. 
uh, and can help other beings and to, to be providing that kind of care and benefit. But the core, the root, is listening. And it's that, uh, that quality of attunement um, that uh, I, is, I would say, what helps most radically to cut through the habits of, of self-view and enables compassionate activity to work most fluidly and, and completely. And in, and in a way that is not anxiety producing, so that someone like uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is, a, I feel, is a, a wonderful embodiment of this. I mean, he's also taken to be a, 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 an embodiment of Chen Rezig, uh, as I understand it. But uh, he has a, a, a tremendous, uh, tremendously compassionate heart, uh, and he feels the, 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 um, for the suffering of others, but he's not one who carries around anxiety. I've met him a number of times over the years. I've been very, very fortunate to be in his company and to be blessed uh, by listening to his teachings. And uh, one of the things that's striking is that he, he enjoys himself. He's, uh, he's joyful. He doesn't let the, the, the extraordinary array of, of uh, difficulties and burdens in his life be burdensome. He doesn't let that be stressful or, or uh, painful, uh, but uh, rather that uh, he is exercising, I would say, as far as I can tell, exercising this quality of compassion in a completely selfless and very, very effective way. So uh, I could also speak uh, somewhat about uh, mudita, uh, 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 sympathetic joy, um, and uh, and equanimity, upeka. Um, but uh, I, I, I would just say uh, briefly that in uh, in both of those cases, they're, they're wholesome emotions. Sympathetic joy means delight at the good fortune of others. It's the opposite of jealousy or envy. Um, uh, but yet, sympathetic joy can be uh, something that is superficial, if we, if we think, oh, I should have mudita, you know, then we can miss the fact that actually we're really jealous. You know, somebody else got appointed to the committee or somebody else got the job. Somebody else got made uh, the, uh, the, the head of the monastery. Someone else got appointed senior nun or became the abbess. Somebody else became the CEO. Someone else got the, their book got published and mine didn't. They think, well, I'm a Buddhist, so I'm, I'm very happy for them you know, through clenched teeth. <laughs> and you're really actually jealous and irritated that, well, what about me? Didn't they notice me? Don't I deserve recognition? So uh, again, that uh, we can take a superficial view of, uh, oh, I should have loving kindness, or I should have compassion, I should have uh, mudita, I should be equanimous. But uh, that because of the self-view aspect, that is not uh, re uh, enabling the, the actuality of the unskillful emotion of jealousy or you know, irritation, resentment, that's not being acknowledged. And so uh, going back to, to metta, how I was talking about metta earlier, maybe a good example would be to say, oh, when somebody else's book gets published and yours gets rejected, uh, rather than you so, trying to suppress your feeling of jealousy, to, to recognize, oh, this is a, a jealous feeling. Uh, this is, I've got a mind, I've got a body. Uh, in a perfect world, I will be feeling happiness for them. But right now I'm thinking, what about me? That's what's here in this moment. So one can have loving kindness, that radical acceptance for a negative emotion. It doesn't mean that you approve of it. You're not saying that it's beautiful or noble. It's unskillful. It's destructive. But here it is. And so uh, that, and I'll, I'll uh, address that aspect of relating to to uh, destructive emotions in, in in a moment. So I feel that's a good example. You are, by opening your heart to that, recognizing this is a jealous feeling, you don't act on it, but you don't suppress it, but you have uh, uh, that quality of, of uh, kindness and open-heartedness to it. Say, this is part of the natural order. I'm attached to my reputation. I want to be published too. <laughs> so there's this feeling of resentment is, has arisen because of that cause that this is the effect and and so seeing it in that way and letting go of the self-concern around it then it's a uh, uh, it's a uh, able to be processed and let go of and it can also be something that is uh, productive of insight and wisdom arising within us 
Well, similarly with uh, with Upeka equanimity, when we ref do the the daily reflections on on uh, the um, sublime abidings and uh, the development of equanimity of Upeka. Uh, is a reflection upon cause and effect. I'm the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma, whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. So it's a reflection on cause and effect. And even though the I am, there's a lot of I am's there, it's understood that that's starting from where we're at, uh, an identification with the body, with the personality, and with uh, starting from the habits of self-view. But it's... Uh, it's not taken as an absolute truth, but rather recognizing this is where we begin, this is where we start from. And then that uh, developing the insight into cause and effect, that again helps to, to helps the, the jitta, the heart, to recognize, oh, th because of this cause, there's this effect. Nothing to get upset about, nothing to be agitated about, nothing to get caught up in. Uh, this is what I hoped for, this is what happened. Uh, uh, so there's a feeling of disappointment because my hope wasn't my, my hope wasn't fulfilled. Or the opposite, this is what I wanted, I got what I wanted, here's this excitement and delight. It doesn't mean that that excitement and delight is good or, or uh, intrinsically beneficial, it means that's the sweet taste that has come from getting what I want, that's all. <laughs> so it's a cause and effect, it helps uh, the mind to see things free of self-view and to, to tilt the, uh, the attitude uh, towards seeing in terms of nature, in terms of Dhamma, rather than in terms of I and me and mine. So I, I would say that roughly all of the, the negative aspects that come from the, uh, say, unskillful handling of, of positive or constructive emotions, they are, almost all of them are fueled by the habits of self-view, I-making and mind-making, ahankara, mamankara, and sakayaditi, self-view. So that's Something to be to be aware of and to be uh, so to be working within our practice. With uh, destructive emotions, getting onto that part of it, I see the time has gone round. It's twelve oh six here in England, so it must be uh, five thirty six in India, I guess. <laughs> um, so getting onto the the second part of, of this um, these reflections. So with respect to destructive emotions. We think about you know, greed, hatred, delusion, uh, jealousy, uh, pride. Um, well, you know those those are I would say very reasonably labeled <laughs> destructive or uh, obstructive, afflictive emotions. And so, if they are followed and acted upon, then they will necessarily bring uh, um, difficulty and dukkha. But just as the constructive emotions can be can be handled in a way that produce dukkha then the destructive emotions can be handled in such a way that they produce uh, liberation, uh, they produce sukha and, and lead to nibbana. And um, so this is a, a, a not praising greed, hatred and delusion, <laughs> you know, jealousy and pride as, as, as uh, beautiful and wonderful things. But if we uh, have a skillful attitude towards them, then they, they, their presence and the energy of them the, the qualities of them can be very productive of, of, uh, and helpful for the development of the parameters, the skillful spiritual qualities. So, for example, many years ago when I, I lived at the uh, Abhayagiri Monastery in California, uh, the, uh, uh, the abbot of, of our main monastery, uh, Lumpur Liam, who was the successor of, of Lumpur Cha as the abbot of, of Wat Papong, he came to visit on, on our invitation. And during his visit, somebody asked him, yeah, Rumpo, um, can you talk about uh, what's been the most difficult uh, problem for you in your development? Uh, what was the, the biggest obstruction or biggest uh, obstacle for you in your practice? And he started to talk uh, about, about fear. He, sa he said, well, when I was younger, fear was a very big issue. That was a very strong presence in my life. And then he, he paused and thought, well, Actually, it's not really helpful to think in terms of obstacles or problems, because it's exactly these kinds of, of uh, qualities of mind that help us to raise our game. Uh, there's a, the, that, uh, the talk where he, he gave this advice is in a little booklet called The Right Angle. 
Uh, he's also a very skillful builder, so it was a, uh, a way of uh, referring to his uh, him using uh, right angles and set squares for his uh, building activities. And uh, so uh, he said that uh, if you consider fear or uh, you know, aversion or any of these kind of uh, afflictive emotions, if you call them problems or obstacles, then so you're you're um, you're not handling them in the most uh, skillful and helpful way because it's by working with these things that we have we have to raise our game. That you uh, when these things arise, then it necessitates. If we're practicing with them, it necessitates a greater quality of patience, greater quality of mindfulness, and that particularly it develops a, a, a lot of wisdom. And so that uh, I feel is a very helpful way to look at. Uh, uh, dis- so-called destructive emotions, if they are, uh, if they are taken, uh, they're received and not taken personally, but are worked with in a in a um, a wise way, then we develop a lot of skills. Another example is uh, Lumpa Chah's uh, comments himself. At one time, many years ago, when somebody was visiting uh, Wapapong. Uh, and uh, after they've been listening to to Lumpur Chah speaking for quite some time, he uh, 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 this visitor said, "Lumpur, you're so wise. You're so incredibly knowledgeable. Surely you've, you've studied all of the suttas, all the commentaries, and you, you know the Abhidharma uh, from beginning to end." And uh, Lumpur Chah's response was, "No, I don't really have a particularly good knowledge of the the suttas, and uh, I haven't really." studied the Abhidhamma very much. If I have any wisdom, it's because I've had a lot of defilements. He said it's because of having a, a lot of, of anger, a lot of lust, a lot of fear, a lot of restlessness. Uh, that's why I've de- if I've developed any wisdom, it's because I've had to work with all of those, those, uh, those challenges. And so that um, uh, I think that the, the uh, person asking the question was quite surprised. <laughs> But uh, Lumpur absolutely meant it. I think the only the only uh, uh, one of the five hindrances he didn't name was dullness. I think everything else was so uh, so hot and electric <laughs> and uh, very uh, very energized. His sort of lust, his fear, his anger, his restlessness. That the dullness and laziness didn't really have a, a look in. That's my personal take on that. So that uh, Lumpur Cha uh, pointed out that rather than resenting those difficulties or feeling like these are bad and wrong and we should wipe, wipe them out, these are the field of study. This is what we learn from. Again, not condoning those qualities like, oh, I've got lots of anger. I want more of it, so I'll, I'll learn more lessons. I would say that's a wrong understanding. Uh, but rather, uh, whatever of those qualities arise on their own, whatever is of the naturally occurring of of uh, greed, hatred, delusion, fear, uh, dis- uh, and uh, you know, lust and uh, uh, jealousy, pride, and so forth. As they arise, we work with them. We don't need to inflate them or, or strengthen them. But uh, if we uh, if we habitually suppress them or, or think of ourselves negatively for those arising, then we're just empowering them and create and, and making them into uh, obstacles to to liberation. Also, it's a uh, I would say one of the aspects of the forest monastic tradition called the Dutanga practices uh, uh, in Tudong in, in Thai language, Dutanga in Pali, uh, is deliber- a deliberately crafted set of practices in order to bring up difficult emotions, uh, d- uh, destructive emotions. So these are the 13 practices that the, the Lord Buddha allowed for the monastic community to, to do to in a, way, in a way raise their game to sort of um, uh, to up the ante to, to use a, a, a gambling uh, uh, motif to to raise the game so that these are like only eating strictly one meal a day, only eating uh, food that is uh, that's given in the village, not receive, not accepting any food that's given in the monastery, uh, only wearing three uh, three robes for monks or five robes for for bhikkhunis. Um, uh, only uh, uh, not living in a in a building, but dwelling at the root of a tree, um, not using the lying down posture, just sitting, standing, walking for 
for your the for your uh, your choice of postures. So never lying down to sleep or, or at all. Um, and then um, a number of, of other ones that um, I won't bore you with. But these kind of of uh, practices that are deliberately limiting the aspects of personal space, sleep, food, and physical comfort. So it's deliberately challenging all those very instinctual urges, like to have a, 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 a reliable and abundant food supply, to have a comfortable place to stay, uh, to be free of aches and pains, and um, yeah, to, to be able to get enough, get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, these are what, what I would refer to as reptile brain instincts. These are very, very basic instincts. So the Jutanga practices are designed to limit those areas uh, so that you, you don't know what you're going to get for, uh, for arms food. You, you're not going to lie down to sleep. You're, you're, you, uh, you don't have a, 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 a kuti or a building to stay in. You're, you're, you're camping out in the wild. Uh, so that it's deliberately challenging those instinctual attachments to food, to sleep, to comfort, to personal space. And so that it's designed to arouse destructive emotions, <laughs> uh, you know, the emotions of irritation, impatience, frustration, and, uh, and so forth. So it's designed to arouse those, in, but in quite clearly delimited uh, circumstances. You're not trying to torture yourself or make yourself miserable, but rather uh, you're, because you're delivering, you know, you, those practices can't be imposed on anybody. You have to ask to do them. You have to choose to do them. But they are consciously and deliberately arousing those difficult states of mind so that you can learn to work with them, so you can develop patience and wisdom and the other parameters uh, from the, the working with those. So I've done a number of those practices over the years, uh, including not lying down and uh, just eating the arms food from the village. And, and I guarantee that they do indeed arouse <laughs> abundance, challenging emotions, uh, destructive emotions, but they're designed to. And so that because you're kind of, it's like going for a hike to climb a mountain, you know it's going to take work to climb the mountain. You, know, you can't get the view from the bottom of the mountain. If you want the view, you've got to do the climbing. So that's part of the of the deal. But then, because you've consciously taken it on, the mind holds it in a in a different way. So, in terms of of day to day practices or how to to work skillfully with some of these destructive emotions or obstructive um, emotions, afflictive emotions in in, a, in our everyday lives, whether we're a lay person or a monastic, um, there's a few practices that we can do because. Um, uh, the uh, I would say the, um, the the challenge is to establish that attitude of radical acceptance, the the, the loving kindness, the open heartedness, to be able to receive those negative states without taking them personally. Like oh, I'm I'm getting angry again, or oh, I'm jealous. I'm a terrible person, um, and so to establish that aspect of of re receptivity. Uh, no, and noticing, acknowledging those negative states um, with, uh, without creating self-view around them. And one of the methods of doing this, strangely enough, uh, this is a method uh, Ajahn Sumedho talked about many years ago, and I found very, very helpful, is when you have a, a, like an angry impulse or a lustful impulse or a jealous impulse or a you know, greedy impulse, uh, when you notice that crossing your mind, then rather than reacting against it, then to, in a sense, catch it and replay that statement it kind of in slow motion, you know, catch it, replay it, slow down. Uh, and so that you are spelling out what the desire mind or the, the angry mind is, is wanting. So that, and it can seem very un-Buddhist, um, in the, the things that you're mentally saying. Don't say them out loud, just say them internally. <laughs> But if, you, if uh, you're irritated with somebody that you work with and that um, uh, you're, you know, you're really upset with someone who you're sharing an office with, and then the feeling comes out, like, oh, God, I wish you, why don't you just die and leave, this, leave me to the office, this office to me? And then if you, just, if you just died and weren't here, everything would be great. And that, that kind of thought can cross the mind. Um, 
And uh, if only you were different, I, or even maybe a slightly mild, you know, if you were different, I would be happy. Maybe it's less violent. <laughs> so if you were different, then I would be happy. And so if you catch that thought going through the mind and then you replay it slowly, if you were different, I would be happy. And my experience of working this, or I mean, why don't you just die? If you died, then life would be great. And then what you find, if you do this in a, a clear, uh, systematic way, is that, I, well, at least I found, I couldn't get to the end of the sentence without kind of, you know, it, it being kind of ridiculous. It would fall apart. I find myself giggling uh, or kind of chuckling to myself in the shrine room. Like, yeah, because it's just, it's absurd. But it's absurd, not because your thinking mind is saying, that's absurd, I sh you know, I, that's a bad thought. I shouldn't be thinking that. But it's absurd because your own natural wisdom has recognized that's ridiculous. You know, if that person was different, I might be happy for a moment, but then I find other things to get upset about. Uh, and if they had died, I probably, there might be some feeling of relief, but then there'd also be a lot of regret and, uh, and, uh, and compassion and uh, feeling for their, their family as well. So, you know, but the mind doesn't even need to spell all of that out. It's just, as you say, make those statements, Oh, and it can be to do with greed. Like, if I had that, you know, if I only had that new house, I would be happy. If only they would promote me, I would be happy. If only they published my book, I'd be happy. And then if you spell it out clearly and slowly, you know, if they published my book, I would be happy. And it falls apart on its own. You know, the, the, the superficiality, the, the kind of shallowness of it is, is obvious. So that's one particular kind of practice. So, so making the darkness conscious, making the darkness visible, I like to call it. So that you're, you're spelling those things out. But then the most important thing is watching it and feeling it fall apart. That's a, a truly appreciating the absurdity of it. That's the, the, the transformative aspect. Another kind of practice that we can do that is uh, uh, Ajahn Chah would, would encourage is uh, a cultivation of wise reflection. So again, being mindful of those different states uh, as they arise, states of greed, hatred, delusion, and uh, anger and jealousy and so on. Um, and uh, uh, it also works really with any kind of judgment is when you notice those, the, those feelings come to mind, just ask the question, is that so? You know, if I got the promotion, I would be happy. Is that so? Yeah. If only I didn't have to, to bother uh, being with these, these people, these dreadful people in my office, uh, then, I would, uh, then everything would be great. Is that so? Uh, it, uh, if, I, if I would be able to be a, 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 a nun or a monk, that would be, uh, my life would be perfect. Is that so? If only I can get, a, get out of being a monk or a nun, uh, my life would be perfect. Is that so? And it's extraordinarily powerful. It's a very, very simple practice. Uh, but uh, I, would say, I would suggest that uh, if um, you apply it carefully and deliberately, then the result is uh, very similar to, to that making the darkness conscious or, that, uh, that there's a recognition in the jitta, your own natural wisdom recognizes, oh, <laughs> that's the mind making a judgment. It's saying, this is good and I want it, or that's bad and I, I want to get away from it. It's seeing a bigger picture. So at that moment, you're strengthening the quality of sati sampajanya, mindfulness and full awareness. The... Um, the uh, the simpler version of that, which is, uh, I, I find, again, it's, uh, there's something described by, by Lumpur Cha, is just to ask the word, just to say the word, so, and the, any kind of judgment that the mind makes, I'm really happy about this, so, this is really awful, so, this is just what I didn't want to happen, so, this is exactly how things should be, so, <laughs> you know, my life is perfect, so, my life is awful. So my life is really mediocre. So as a, as a one word practice, but again, if that's, it, it takes the, the mindfulness to notice the, 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 the strings of thought and the judgments being made. But if this is applied, this is an extraordinary, extraordinarily liberative and 
clarifying practice, kind of marvelous in the way that it just brings that, oh, <laughs> it, uh, it uh, arouses and strengthens that sati sampajanya, mindfulness and full awareness, that's a recognition of the mind is making a judgment. That's all. I, I call this color beautiful. How could it be beautiful to everybody? Other people think it's it's off-putting or ugly. What, why should the uh, the view that my mind has everybody else's? How could it be? Oh, and so that uh, the result of that, even though the mind might be making judgments and and getting caught up with excitement or irritation and negativity, it's, it's a tremendous balancing uh, uh, and a kind of integrating quality that, that comes with this sort of practice because it helps the mind to see a bigger picture. How could everybody else have the same opinion as me? And why should my opinion or why should my point of view be the one that is correct and true and good? How could that be? Oh, <laughs> so the result of reflecting on these kind of judgments and, and react, reactive emotions in this way is that it helps us to harmonize with each other far more completely, that uh, you're able to accept other people's points of view uh, in, a, in a more complete way, rather than assuming that because somebody thinks differently from, from me, that somehow wrong or stupid. <laughs> it's just, well, of course, they're seeing it from a different angle. It's like right now, you know, we're in different countries around the world, different time zones, all the way from uh, from Thailand and Singapore, you know, in India, here in uh, in the, in Europe, in the UK, in in Peru, uh, that the, that all over the world, we're all in different countries. We're in different times. You know, what time is it here in England? It's twelve twenty-five in the middle of the day, and all of you in different countries. You'll be saying no, no, it's not twelve twenty-five. It's uh, it's five fifty-five in India, and it's uh, early morning in Peru, I guess. Uh, it's uh, and it's uh, late later in the evening in Singapore. So, what time is it? They're different numbers that we put to this time right now. So, it's a very good example of how one uh, person's experience is necessarily different from somebody else's. So that. Um, simple application of that practice is uh, is very helpful, supportive. And uh, the last kind of practice I would uh, suggest in terms of working with, with difficult, destructive or afflictive emotions is to simply name what the feeling is. So this is the, you know, uh, oh dear, I've been given an office uh, with that person. Uh, I thought I was going to get away from him feeling. That's what this is. <laughs> Just no comment, not whether that feeling should be there or shouldn't be there, not even labeling it as destructive or, or, uh, or uh, problematic, but just naming what's there. Because in that moment, what, what the mind is doing is recognizing, is you know, it's stepping out of the content of that judgment, that, that feeling, and noticing, oh, this is a feeling. You're not suppressing it. You're not, uh, you're not uh, fearing it or hating it or identifying with it, just saying, in this mind, here is the, um, uh, I've just arrived at the train station and the train has, uh, the, I'm told the train is going to be 12 hours late, feeling. That's what this is. Oh, this is the, um, uh, I, was in, uh, I was enjoying my life at Abhayagiri and now I suddenly find I'm going to be moving to Amravati, in back to England again. Oh, that's this feeling. It was 10, 11 years ago, 12, nearly 12 years ago, 12 years ago now. <laughs> so once we know that as a feeling, then the, uh, you're not suppressing it, you're not identifying with it. There's a clarity that, okay, that's what this feeling is. So then with that, that clarity and that spaciousness around the feeling, the emotion that's there, then the jitta can respond with mindfulness and wisdom rather than reacting with self-view. So that um, even though in English the words reacting and responding might seem quite similar, they're very, very different in terms of Buddhist psychology and Western psychology too. But the, so to respond means there's some mental space there. It's, there's, a, there's a quality of mindfulness and, and full awareness. And, so the, and the response is able to be uh, so guided by mindfulness and wisdom rather than uh, 
by self-view. If it's a reaction, it's almost always uh, guided by self-view and I and me and mine. And so the result of, re of reactivity will be more, more dukkha or more, more uh, conflict or alienation. If we learn to respond rather than to react, and those responses to come from, from mindfulness and wisdom rather than from self-view and, and uh, conceit, then the result will always incline towards vimuti, towards liberation, towards nibbana, towards uh, peacefulness. So these are a number of reflections um, uh, up today. Uh, see, it's just about an, uh, an hour since uh, we began the session. So I'll close my comments there and uh, open things up for the uh, questions and responses. Thank you, Venerable, for a very enlightening teaching. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, anybody would like to ask a question may kindly raise the virtual hand or maybe put them in the chat box. Okay, any questions? Okay, this uh, Ms. Pallavi Kishore. Yeah, um, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, thank you. So thank you for the lecture. I have a very specific question. When you were telling us the strategies to deal with these destructive emotions, uh, I think I mixed up some of them. So my question is, uh, you, to you told us one strategy was ask the question, so, so my life is perfect, so, um, and then you said another one, and then you said name the feeling. So I've been given an office with this bad guy and just look at it as a feeling and don't classify the feeling as good or bad or anything else. Just look at it as a feeling. But between these two techniques, there was something which I think I mixed up. So could you repeat that? Uh, I don't think there was. I think that was the one immediately followed on from the other. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think you missed anything. Your 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 recall is pretty good anyway. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, no, there was that um, that one that uh, one about naming the naming the feeling was immediately following on from the so so practice. Okay, thank you so much. May I ask a question? Please, yeah. Namo Buddhaya. Um, I am Gina from Malaysia. I would mm -hmm. like to ask um, Ajahn, when you said, you anyone said something, let, let's say for example, um, a friend said, I am getting married next week. And then I, I, would, I would respond with, Within myself, of course. So, um, I just, isn't it a little bit disrespectful? And it's like nullifying someone's happiness and, and, and joy. What do you think? Uh, thank you so much for your answer, Ajay. Yeah. No, good question. Uh, yeah, that, that, um, that, that uh, way of uh, of questioning uh, it can be applied with different attitudes. Uh, I, I appreciate your your comment. It can seem disrespectful, uh, but uh, I would say uh, you know, as long as you certainly don't say it out loud. <laughs> but also just that uh, even though you are, might have a lot of uh, empathy and, and the closeness with that that person and feel feel happy for them. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, I, I, I might be out of order here, but also it gives a, a bigger picture that uh, to um, so uh, that to the you know, the the human family, you know, two people choose to get married. You know, so how many people are getting married today? Right now, probably the, all kinds of weddings are happening, and so it's. Uh, uh, and forgive me if that's, it seems out of order, out of place, or, or um, uh, disrespectful. But it's it's also helping to see, you know, this is part of the of the whole sort of 
human uh, realm of activity. This is what uh, uh, people do. It, it isn't anything special. It's very, very, very special for the people involved and also those close to them. But from the, the broader perspective, it's just two people coming together. That's that's uh, just part of the 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 our living system. Our, our, our human families is part of what we do. And so, uh, again, Tati Ampi, forgive me if that seems a bit too cold or, or uh, insensitive, but uh, it, the, often it's if we if we take a broader view, we, we step back from our own family concerns or our local concerns or our immediate groups concerns, and we look at the uh, the 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 world and the human family as part of a of a an organic system. Then it's uh, you know the two beings coming together. Then it's not remarkable. Just like if they were uh, if they weren't people, if they were you know two birds or two you know two fishes or you know two two other animals. It's like oh well you know, they're, they're coming together as well. And again, that might that might seem very disrespectful or or. Um, Say not not appreciating the uniqueness of the human condition, but uh, uh, the general point the general point of seeing things in terms of nature rather than from a personal perspective that provides a little bit of extra room, extra space in appreciating the situation. So I don't know if that's uh, that seems uh, helpful or appropriate, uh, but uh, that's what I would suggest is how to apply that practice, but also. Uh, it can be that you know, not all practices are appropriate to every situation. So if you find that uh, if you apply that with respect to this, uh, the, the marriage of your friend, then and, and then it just brings up negative feelings in you. Fine, fine. Leave it aside. It's like uh, it's uh, not all not all tools are, are appropriate for every task. So I, ho I hope that's useful. Yes, thank you very much. You say if not. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I think Karen raised a hand there. Karen, could you uh, good please? Evening, Ajahn. Um, my name's Karen. I was just wondering, and I promise I'm not being facetious. I'm just wondering whether the the um, the question, the technique, so. It seems like we all hung out on this this particular technique. Uh, is that appropriate when you actually use it um, in in actually uh, looking deeper into the noble truth? Say, for example, there is suffering. So, <laughs> is everything is uh, does not have inherent existence. So, does that work for 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 a deeper understanding of the the, the noble truths and and all the other dhammas as well? Try it and see. <laughs> try it out because it's it's like different different things work for different people and uh and so i'm i'm a great advocate of experimentation that uh i don't feel that when when you see uh a, a dhamma uh dhamma teaching in a book or someone's someone's talk and they say if you do this this will be well i i always feel like well wait a minute you can't be so uh, you can't be so generalized. Different things work for different people. It's like uh, different foods uh, uh, appeal to different people. Different kinds of of, uh, of decor. You know, they are uh, different things that work for different people in different ways. We all got different conditioning, and so that uh, I would say try it out and see what the result is. Because say with, with the four noble truths. One of the aspects of that, again, that, that uh, Ajahn Sumato would emphasize over the years is that they're called noble truths because they're not absolute truths. Look at absolute reality. It's a, it's a description of an experience, but it's called the noble truth of dukkha is, uh, is the noble truth because if it's understood and fully appreciated, then it leads towards liberation. It leads towards realization of Dhamma. That's that's what that's what makes it noble. So it's not an absolute truth, but it's it's noble because if it's followed and used in a skillful way, the result is uh, is that of, of liberation. So that is something that you can you can explore. Also within the Northern Buddhist tradition, in the Heart Sutra, uh, if you're familiar with uh, with that at all, um, which starts off with uh, 
uh, a, a reflection on uh, the five khandhas that, that uh, form is emptiness, emptiness itself is form, form is not separate from emptiness, emptiness is not separate from form. So too with feeling, perceptions, mental formations, consciousness. Then later, uh, as it goes on, it says, um, uh, there is no suffering, there is no or, or, origin of suffering, there is no cessation, there is no, there is no way. No, no understanding and no attaining, for there is nothing to attain. So, that's a, you know, very, very frequently recited and studied sutra from the Northern Buddhist tradition, that very <laughs> empty nature, the, the empty nature of the Four Noble Truths is something that's reflected upon. And... Uh, so that it's uh, it's saying yes, these are noble truths, but they're not absolute. They're not everything. So perhaps if uh, reflecting on that that question, so <laughs> that uh, can help open up that that insight that uh, these are um, skillful means. They're like profoundly beneficial, skillful means, but they're not the uh, they're not the ultimate reality itself. Does that make sense? Yes, Lumpur. I shall try. Mm -hmm. um, now, may I request all those uh, participants to kindly keep your mics on mute while Venerable Teacher is talking? Thank you. Any other questions, please? As a hand from Pallavi Kishore. Okay, Pallavi. Um, hi, I just have a second question. My question is, so um, one lady asked a question that my friend is getting married and should I use the so technique? So, uh, you know, you had mentioned about how these techniques can be used for dealing with destructive emotions. Now, uh, if we want to use it with positive emotions, like her friend is getting married and, you know, they're happy. So uh, if we use it, like you said that, uh, well, it's just an activity which human beings perform, like marriage. So uh, does it mean that we have to be indifferent are we saying that we should be indifferent to the happiness of others? How, how, I mean, I didn't get that bit. Uh, I was, no, it's not indifferent. Um, it's just not carried away. I mean, because you can very, very effectively use this same method. Uh, as I was saying with, with asking, is that so? Uh, similarly, with, with very positive experiences, you know, I, I got what I wanted. Hooray! Yeah, uh, is our usual. <laughs> Uh, our, our usual reaction, um, but uh, if we take this kind of reflection, I got what I wanted. So it means there's still the, the enjoyment of having got what you wanted. You're not trying to 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 create a kind of sourness or a nihilism, but rather just uh, uh, seeing things in their context, feeling things in a in a broader broader context, so that there's still the enjoyment, there's still the, the happiness of people, other people's good fortune. But you're just not uh, getting lost in that, or not looking at. Because it's it's like problems come when we take uh, pleasant experiences as an absolute good. So uh, Venerable Ajahn Chah spent a lot of time talking about not clinging to happiness, not clinging to success. Uh, he would talk. He would talk about it. I, I gave an online talk on this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, it, I think the, the title of the talk was. Happiness is dukkha in disguise. <laughs> and uh, you can probably find it, uh, it was organized by the Angel Group in Bangkok. If you're interested, it's probably on, recorded on Facebook too. So you're, you're not trying to suppress those feelings of happiness, but rather recognizing this feeling of, uh, this flush of joy, of delight, that comes with getting what you want or friends getting married and the kind of, uh, that, uh, it's it is it's got a sweet taste, but that's not an absolute good. It's not an absolute uh, it's not an absolute joy. It's necessarily fragile. It's necessarily empty of, of fundamental substance. So you're recognizing that um, that the that there is that there's sweetness and bitterness, you know. Uh, but they uh, the mind is learning to hold that. With a like with a, a, a delicate in a delicate grip, it's not uh, it's not grasping it. It's when we take uh, either painful experiences or pleasant experiences as as absolute. This is absolutely good. This is absolutely awful. 
that's when we create more turbulence and, and dukkha and division for ourselves. And the mysterious thing is, uh, I've found, is that when you cultivate this kind of, of spacious attitude towards success and failure, happiness and, and unhappiness, then you find yourself far more able to attune to the situation in a way you can kind of enjoy it more <laughs> because you're not clinging to it. There's that uh, the delicate holding of it rather than grasping. And so it's mysterious, but uh, the, the sweet things are, are sweeter because you're not trying to keep them. As William Blake put it in uh, his uh, verses on joy, that... Uh, uh, he that binds himself to a joy doth the winged life destroy. He that kisseth a joy, a joy as it flies, lives in eternity's sunrise. It's a bit, yeah, it's a 18th century language, <laughs> but uh, uh, hopefully you can get the meaning that if you bind yourself to a joy, and so that that's the the winged life uh, is destroyed. That's like you 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 crush the happiness by trying to keep it and own it and. and and make too much of it. But if you kiss the joy as it flies, then you live in eternity's sunrise. That's the, a very beautiful poetic way of expressing it. So it's not very Buddhist, not very monastic to talk about kissing the joy as it flies. But in terms of psychology, uh, it's, uh, I feel totally appropriate because it's representing that that attitude of non-grasping. So like I was saying about His Holiness the Dalai Lama or, or or Lumpo Cha, you know, they had, uh, uh, His Holiness has, you know, vast amount of responsibilities and people who are looking and depending on him, but he, he really enjoys himself. He's a joyful person. Uh, Lumpo Cha also, he was, uh, being around him, even though the Wat Pong Monastery was famous for being a real, real, uh, you know, ascetic boot camp, it was, you know, really austere place to live. But he, when you were around him, he felt he was the happiest man in the world. And so that uh, because of not owning anything, <laughs> not, uh, not being possessive. Uh, and uh, so it's not pushing things away, uh, but not grasping hold with that quality of, of attunement, which is really the, the middle way. And the, the, it's like the, the, that, that quality uh, of um, attunement to Dhamma uh, that is possible for us that is, has got that, that uh, sort of joyfulness and ease, like a supreme comfort. Thank you. Uh, is there another question from the audience? I see Tobias. Hello. 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 Thank you. Um, I have a question. I mean, I guess it maybe involves the whole Buddhist way, but I, I feel uh, I'm noticing a lot of attachment to like sensual pleasures or, or also like cravings. And, and maybe could you give a few more hints on how to detach and become more free from that, especially as a lay person, because I, I, I'm afraid I couldn't do all that practices in a family life for example yeah uh, well uh, uh, I, I would I would encourage uh, experimenting with a few things uh, with sensual pleasure and that um, using the quality of wise reflection and uh, naming the feeling so that if you are you know, if you're in Berlin and you're going out to a really nice cafe with the family think oh I'm really going to enjoy this. And to, um, oh, this is my favorite cafe. This is going to be great. And just to, to notice uh, as you go, as you're making your way to the, with the family to this great cafe. Um, okay, here is my mind uh, creating this feeling. Uh, you're not suppressing it, but it's like, oh, here's the, the mind is filled with expectation. And here's this, um, uh, there's this kind of flush of excitement of the prospect of this good thing. And then, um, then when you're in the cafe, I'm not, I'm not sure what your particular sense pleasures are, but uh, if you're if you're in the cafe and then you're having some particular kind of food to eat or uh, a um, particular kind of uh, of coffee, and then just noticing, yeah, uh, this is this is the experience of total enjoyment. That's what this is, 
you're not suppressing it, you're not complaining, you're not criticizing it, you're saying, here is the mind saying, yes, to this piece of cake or whatever, this cup of coffee, like, this, this is the yes feeling. Okay, that's all. That's what, that's what this is. So you're, you're acknowledging the, the experiences that, that's, that's there and not, not adding anything onto it. And then, uh, and then the, um, the, uh, when the, somebody in the family says, would, would you like another slice of cake? Then you think, ah, now here's a, here's a turning point. <laughs> Something in me wants to say yes. But uh, 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 if you're applying this kind of a practice just to, to, uh, to say, okay, now there's a, there's a decision in here. Now, um, what, what do I want to do? Do I really need another slice of cake? Uh, would it would it be up, would it be upsetting to my partner or to the, the kids if I didn't if they they all want to have one and I don't um, what seems appropriate here and just that amount of space just that much of consideration reading the situation you know what what feels most uh, what feels most appropriate here and it might be that another slice of cake is totally appropriate and uh, uh, but then. Uh, and then after you've had the second slice of cake, assuming you, you take one, then to, then to consider, okay, having followed that, having acted on that, what's the result? Do I feel, uh, do I feel contented and at ease? Or do I feel like, oh, no, I was just kidding myself. You know, uh, I, you know, I was just total greed and I got totally lost again. Then look at that. I think, okay, here is the, oh, that was total greed. I got totally lost again. Feeling. That's what this is. And so... Yeah, again, not creating self-view or self-criticism out of it, but recognizing, okay, that choice was made. I did take the second slice of cake, and now this is the feeling. Full stop. You don't have to add anything onto that. Just let that feeling have its effect. And so then you're watching the kind of the whole process from sort of the beginning, the middle, the end. And then rather than uh, having the 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 thinking mind, the kind of super ego saying uh you know you should not have uh you shouldn't be greedy you should just take what you need um coming from a sort of uh finger wagging you know you should there's far more of a it, the, the, the learning from having sort of overdone it or got lost from a from that felt sense is far deep far deeper and far more real and so that it's when when that same situation comes around again then rather than, oh, you know, I really got lost last time, I shouldn't get lost this time, in creating a kind of a tangle. Instead, uh, it's far more, um, do, I want to, do I really want to do that again? Do I want to go there again? And, it, and the, those kind of things fall away on their own. So it's not even, a, not even a letting go, really. It's just things fall away in the light of, of wisdom. But again, it's, uh, it's, Often it's self-view, my problem or you know, my sensuality problem, and I've got to get over this. That it's it's well intentioned, but it by being co-opted by self-view, that always complicates it and confuses the picture. And the more that working with with passions and addictions can be dealt with free of, of free, with free of self-view, then uh, that uh, helps that those things to to really fall away. In that little, uh, I did a, a collection of four booklets about the Brahma Viharas, and the one on Mudita, rather than focusing on uh, its obstacles being jealousy and envy, I focused on addiction as, uh, and like self, uh, that the kind of my happiness, my comfort, my pleasure is the, the most important thing in the world. So I focused on, uh, well, each of the, the Brahma Viharas, I, I looked at them through the lens of what obstructs them or makes them uh, distorts them. And so with Mudita, Sympathetic Joy, I, I focused on addiction. And it, so that book, that little book is, is called Just One More. Speaking from experience. <laughs> uh, any other questions from the audience? There's a hand from Ram Nandan Singh. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Wonderful Bhante, during your talk, you said you should love 
even enemies those who are enemical to you is it possible in day to day life how could we achieve that stage of emotion to love even enemies well you uh, as i was saying love is not the same as liking so you it, it might be impossible to like your enemies or people who wish you harm and uh, and are, are you know look down on you and so on but uh, but you can find a place in the heart where uh, there is no hatred for them so that's why the ajahn sumedha's t- uh, phrase not dwelling in aversion is a very good way of representing metta so that you're not trying to make yourself like people who hate you or wish you ill or, or try, really want to make you uh, want to make you suffer um, but you can recognize that some people get so caught up in their own their own world view their own passions their own biases that that's how they act you don't like it but that's the way the world is so that you're not you're not dwelling in aversion towards that you're so that you can uh, you can be kind to that which you don't like and that that's really really important so yeah the, uh, it's more the kindness aspect of loving kindness <laughs> is that uh, i would say is uh, is the um, the significant part in terms of its expression so you can be kind and you can refuse to hate even that which is uh, uh, oppressive and difficult and i think yeah um uh, I pres- uh, i'm guessing you're in india and uh, you know the the example yes. of mahatma gandhi if i might use him as an example you know he refused to hate the british he called them an evil presence in india but he refused to hate them <laughs> but the 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 british government and the the, the uh, british supremacy there in india he would not hate anybody and uh, i feel that was a, a tremendously powerful message and uh, and a force within what he was doing uh, uh, i don't want to get into indian politics but just uh, as a i feel on the human level that was a a very wonderful example that his his uh, his message had great strength because he refused to hate but he was absolutely determined to uh, to get in the way of the british <laughs> and and succeeded in in uh, in ending british rule in in india and so that that refusal to hate even people who are have you know negative and destructive thoughts towards you that's the the we, that we can do and i would say that looking at those those vengeful or vindictive hurtful feelings within us recognizing those recognizing knowing them for what they are and choosing not to act on them then slowly but surely we can find that that place where we are uh, we are kind we can be kind and uh, and accepting it doesn't mean that we're passive just like mahatma gandhi was very very much not passive <laughs> but uh, he is very very active but he uh, he would not cultivate hate and he wouldn't support hate in any of his forms uh, and i feel that there's many instances of that i hold the mulku atle ata ka so that anyway i would say that uh, it's certainly possible but uh, i would use the word um being uh, being kind towards things that are unlikable you refuse to buy into that hate because even the people who are, have, have acted in very destructive and harmful ways they're still living beings they might be you know, lost in their delusions uh, um and their actions might be very destructive but uh, more hate is not going to to help like in the the, the verses that we recite on the sharing of blessings we consciously share the blessings of our lives the good karma of our lives with those who are friendly indifferent and hostile with the highest gods and evil forces we're not condoning what they do but we're not but we're sharing the goodness of our life because more hatred is only going to make things worse whereas sharing good karma with uh, with other beings is uh, likely to be uh, beneficial 
So, so may all beings, those who are friendly, indifferent or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless. So that's, that's a, an aspiration, but it's based on that uh, more hatred is only going to make things more troublesome, more difficult, more divisive. So I hope that's Thank you. And see, we're coming around to... 6.30 in India. Yes, so Andrew, we are almost... Uh... Yes, 6.30 in India. Yes. Uh, so I think we will wrap up with this. Uh, thank you, Venerable, for your teaching, very enlightening teaching, and also for all the questions that came up. Uh, so let us now, since we are many participants, uh, almost we hit 100 and now we are about 70 participants. So let us all now dedicate the merit uh, thus gathered towards the happiness of all sentient beings. And on behalf of IBC and all the participants joining us online, we would like to thank our very dear teacher, Venerable Ajahn Amrut, for, uh, for his blessings and for his teaching. And we pray for Venerable's uh, good health and long life. And we also hope to have more teachings from you, Venerable, in the future. Um, I would also like to thank all the participants for patiently joining us. And uh, also, uh, we look forward to having you all for our next uh, Dhamma talk, which is next Friday. That would be taught by Zongsa Jaman Kensei Rinpoche on the topic uh, contemporary issues practicing the path in the world today, same time, 5 to 6.30. And uh, for more information, please uh, look up uh, on our website, ibcworld.org. And we look forward to having you all again. Thank you so much, Vanderbu. Have a good night. Sarva Mangalam. Thank you.